everybody. This is Deanna Minnick, and welcome to the Detox Summit. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Kelly Brogan, who is boarded in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, reproductive psychiatry, and integrative holistic medicine. What a fantastic combination. I mean, really bringing together mind, body, uh, reproductive health, and in a very integrated way. Dr. Brogan also practices functional medicine, which, as you know, you've been hearing from a lot of the speakers, is a root cause approach to illness as a manifestation of multiple interrelated systems. She studied cognitive neuroscience at MIT, and she received her medical degree from Cornell University. She completed her residency and fellowship at Bellevue NYU. And truly, she is one of the nation's only physicians with perinatal psychiatric training who takes a holistic evidence-based approach in the care of patients with a focus on environmental medicine and nutrition. I can't think of anybody better for this summit to talk with us about prenatal, perinatal issues, talking about maternal, transgenerational programming, and all of the issues as they relate to toxicity. So welcome, Dr. Brogan, to the Detox Summit. Thank you, Deanna. It's such a pleasure. Total honor. Really great to have you. Again, I've been, uh, you were one of the first on my list as I was thinking um, about all the different topics and really hoping that you can help us to dive into uh, so many of the questions that people have about children and, and toxicity and what we're doing to our planet. So we'll definitely get there. And before we get into those questions, um, what I really like for you to do is to unfold a little bit about your story your personal journey. Tell us about you. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Uh, so I think like many practitioners who find themselves in a more holistic paradigm, there is always sort of a tipping point in terms of, you know, personal health. And for me, the sort of context was that I was raised in a sort of a family that in many ways deified the medical model and I was influenced uh, in terms of my, my parents' uh, perceptions of what a physician really was and how important they were and the, you know, the, the influence that they wield. And so I pursued many of the sort of more biomedical aspects, biological aspects of medicine. Uh, I was very interested in pharmacology and, and really, I guess, persuading myself that there was a way to master uh, the human body, and it was through going to medical school and, and training. I'm also, though, and have been, I think, since adolescence, uh, a feminist and believe very passionately in, in the power of, uh, you know, sort of women, uh, women's health, women's influence, their sort of special, unique productivity. And so I sort of found myself interested in obstetrics. And once I did my rotation in medical school, I realized that that was not a way to help women <laughs> by any stretch and found that there was a specialization in psychiatry called reproductive psychiatry, which is essentially women's mental health. Um, and through that, I specialized in essentially medicating uh, pregnant and postpartum lactating women, so helping them to determine uh, through the available literature, which is, of course is a topic we should probably address in terms of the integrity of that literature, but uh, helping them to make decisions about whether or not to take medications like Zoloft or lithium. And I really found the model uh, incredibly limiting. Uh, and I felt, I felt that offering them this sort of ones or zeros approach, you know, take medication or don't, and good luck with that, mm. um, to be very reductionist. And that's what really opened my mind to pursuing uh, alternative medicine in the most classical sense. So, you know, looking into what is the evidence base for things like fish oil or San E or St. John's wort, uh, and could these be viable alternatives? But even that sort of green pharmacy was in many ways felt limiting to me because I began to go on my own personal journey at that point. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, postpartum thyroiditis after my first pregnancy, uh, which was in my fellowship. And, you know, I was now, I see this in my practice all the time, but I was that person who bounced back, you know, three weeks postpartum, I was back at work, I had lost all my baby weight, and then some, it's probably a bit hypomanic myself, you know, mm. just hyperproductive. And over, you know, the following months, I started to slow down, I became really forgetful and cloudy, I was, you know, I had my private practice at the time, and I was double booking patients, forgetting my PIN number for my ATM card, and 
you know, all of these sorts of subtle things that you could easily credit to just being a new mom. And on just a routine physical, you know, it was discovered that I had Hashimoto's and I, you know, I've never had a health problem in my life, totally abused my body for about a decade. And I said, this is not something I'm signing up for. Chronic disease is not something I'm interested in. So I had the good sense to see a naturopath. And that was really the beginning for me. And, and everything that I've learned through that journey, you know, I've now, uh, in, in many ways, uh, I suppose all the relevant ways resolved resolve my Hashimoto's and I, uh, and I bring that journey and the knowledge that I've acquired through it to my practice. And I see the difference between just using, you know, haphazard non-medication approaches versus really looking at the web and looking to the root. And so now I have, I bring that to a, a strong sense of activism. I have a many strong opinions about things that need to change in the world. And it's informed by, uh, I guess my, you know, knowledge of acquired knowledge of how important uh preventive medicine really is and what it consists of wow, wow. What, what a story what a journey and all of the things that you've been through personally and i'm just trying to think how did you as a, a mom and a medical student uh, a wife i mean how did you juggle all of these roles how do how can women really do that um, and feel empowered and feel that their lives are transforming rather than being bogged down by by all of the stress and the toxicity of the layers and layers of responsibility? I, I'm just curious because you've yeah. done so many different things and even listening to your own health journey within all of the other things that you were doing, do you think that the illness, the thyroiditis, you know, was that kind of, man was that manifest based on all of the different things that you were going through besides the pregnancy? Well, it's, it's hard to overestimate the stress of a medical training. So I think that that mm. um, really set, set the stage. And in many ways, you know, uh, as is the case for most people who, who, find themselves at the limits of what conventional medicine can offer. It's just the door opening to a whole nother um, paradigm. But it's a really relevant question you're asking because I think that for me, having kids and, and bringing life into the world was really the catalyst for me to develop a greater interest in all of these largely invisible influences on, on not only the health of children, but of course of, of adults and, and the elderly, et cetera. So for me, the, the beauty of my life really is that all of my brain passions, you know, all the things that I care about and care to learn about also uh, benefit my health, benefit my children's health and benefit my friends and family. So it's all really, um, synergized in a, in a powerful way. I mean, I think it's so easy to feel consumed uh, by the pursuit of knowledge around environmental toxicity and uh, chronic disease and the interplay between the two. It's easy to feel sort of like a sky is falling nihilism about it and, and to, to say, I can't handle that and I just need to keep doing what I already know. But I also feel that my pursuit of functional medicine has you know, sort of ignited in me this like hunger, I guess, for, for learning and for the feeling of empowerment that comes through just being open uh, to what we don't yet know and being excited about what we may learn, you know, sort of mm -hmm. if we all put our heads together. So I think it's, it's, it is hard to balance because I'm, you know, I'm very, very obsessive about this learning process. I mean, I spend every waking moment, you know, reading and, and writing and teaching and going to conferences and lectures. And it's, it's a total, you know, passion project. And it does take me away in many ways from the parts of my life that I'm looking to enhance through this knowledge, right? It's, it's a very difficult balance, but um, it's also a, you know, I guess a stage that I'm in, a productive stage that I'm in in my personal and professional life that I, you know, it seems like it can't really be any other way, but it's, I think it's, it's important to come at it from a place of enthusiasm and excitement rather than a place of fear, yes. Yes. you know, fear and, and, uh, you know, yeah, ex health. exactly. No, I'm glad that you bring that up because um, after listening to so many of these different talks, I can imagine that the listeners are starting to feel some apprehension. And that's why um, within every recording, within every interview, what we do focus on are what are the solutions. Yes, absolutely. Because that's what we want to leave uh, everybody with. 
So I'm kind of curious uh, just about your clinical practice because, gosh, you've got so many different skills and the way that you think is so novel. It's so revolutionary. And I feel that you're really on the forefront of, of change, especially in this whole area of psychiatry, which has been, I would say, more or less a very stagnant profession in some ways, you know, the talk therapy, kind of the traditional things. So when somebody comes to you, what is your process? Can we get inside your mind a little bit as far as how do you approach a patient, especially somebody that might be pregnant? How do you think about toxicity? How are you thinking uh, with respect to nutraceuticals versus pharmaceuticals? Can we just kind of understand your process a little bit more as to how do you put all of these great ideas into action? Absolutely. I think that uh, you bring up so many relevant points, and and I'd like to touch on uh, some of my learned perspectives about conventional psychiatry because uh, I I believe I have one of the more radical perspectives on uh, on the role of psychopharmaceuticals in particularly women's health, but probably in in mental health overall. So for the most part, uh, my intention is to really bring the notion um, to to my patients, but potentially also to a broader audience, that that symptoms of mental illness, whether it's depression or schizophrenia or OCD or bipolar or even generalized anxiety, that these are really the downstream, totally nonspecific manifestations of upstream events, right? So this is a a very popular Mm -hmm. theme, right, in in functional medicine, but very few people are applying it to psychiatry. And I I even see that my uh, holistically minded, you know, practitioner friends get put off, you know, that they even refer me their patients with quote unquote psychiatric problems because they feel like maybe, well, maybe in fact they do need an antidepressant or maybe they do need an anti-anxiety medicine because I can't get at their symptoms. But the way that I look at it is that you know, until proven otherwise, the symptoms that they are coming to me with are endocrine, Mm -hmm. immune, or gastrointestinal in nature. And that's sort of how I think about it. And that basically encompasses, right, the whole of human physiology. So we're really trying to find a way, a point of entry. And so when I have a patient come in, I basically assume, and this is my bias, and I think everybody, you know, brings their own stylistic bias to, to their practice, but I basically assume that they are inflamed until proven otherwise. Mm. And so when I, when I am interviewing them and when I am doing diagnostic work, so I do, you know, the usual things. I do blood work, uh, extensive blood work. I do salivary, um, adrenal testing. I do stool tests on pretty much everyone. So when I am undergoing this process, I'm thinking about personalizing it to them. So I'm thinking about how can I understand where the nidus is, like where is the the most salient point of disturbance. And I also draw on, you know, a couple of decades of literature in psychiatry that tells us that the gut brain axis is where it's at, (laughs) you know, that that's where to start and that it's not, you know, this newfangled naturopathic idea of quote unquote leaky gut. And it's, it doesn't just stop there. That in fact, there, there's some really fascinating. And in fact, I get probably four or five papers across my desk every week that talk about what's called the cytokine theory mm. of mental illness, right? So, which stands in, in stark contrast to what is accepted by most of the population as the explanation for mental illness, which is the monoamine hypothesis. So that's, you know, thinking about, you know, things like depression as being a serotonin deficiency. Mm -hmm. But in my learning about alternative explanations for symptoms like uh, depression, I've started to delve into the evidence base for what is the conventionally accepted model, right? This serotonin model, for example. And I've really had my mind blown, (laughs) you know, no pun intended. I've, I've really found that as have many other, you know, expert researchers, you know, people like Irving Kirsch and David Healy, you know, people who've really, you know, looked under the hood. Mm-hmm. It's, it's quite disturbing um, to, to look at the history of how we have come to accept that medications like antidepressants, SSRI antidepressants, are in fact resolving an imbalance. And that this notion is perpetuated, you know, I, I'm not going to get too polit- political here, but that this notion is really perpetuated by 
the influence of pharmaceutical companies, particularly through um, direct-to-consumer advertising, where pharmaceutical companies are telling patients directly that they have you know, an imbalance. And those patients are bringing that idea to their doctors who are also learning that same, you know, sort of rhetoric from these same pharmaceutical companies. And then they're colluding together in a way that, in my opinion, totally sidesteps what is actually driving the problem most of the time. And I can give a couple of, of examples, clinical examples of what might, you know, what might be drivers of, of these sorts of symptoms. But the big you know, sort of downfall here is that when you engage, you know, when a patient and a doctor engage in this relationship and they decide together that Prozac, for example, is going to resolve their problem, they're potentially setting that patient up for a lifetime dependency on a medication that will uh, perturb multiple systems. So not just the serotonin system, but also the what we call the HPA axis, so the sort of brain uh, endocrine, you know, uh, feedback loops. And it's quite disturbing. I mean, that's actually why I haven't started a patient on medication, on a psychiatric medication in years. The reason is because I started to see what it looks like for patients to come off of these medications. And, and I started to learn more about what they are actually doing in the body and how little that has to do with healing them. So it's uh, it's it's forced me to to divine other methods, mm-hmm. and and for the most part, those methods really encompass um, looking at leveraging nutrigenomics and looking at leveraging lifestyle change. It's so incredibly simple on some level. The starting point, mm-hmm. um, you know, when I meet a patient, the first three things that I I contract with them about um, are are dietary change. Very, very minimal engagement in relaxation response. So, you know, a simple meditation practice, meaning like five minutes a day, uh, and also a similarly limited engagement in movement. So, in, in exercise, uh, meaning like literally 10 to 15 minutes a day, because most of the patients that are coming to me are, are sick, you know, and, and they're not just depressed. It never is just a head up phenomenon, it's always a full body experience of, you know, sort of generation. So I have to meet them where they are, but that's where I begin. And then while I'm gathering diagnostics, often there's, you know, sort of major shifts before we even do anything, you know, in terms of using supplementation or more specific, you know, sort of diet based tricks and things like that. So Mm -hmm. it's just a different way of of thinking about it. And it's probably much more like the way that, you know, that you and other enlightened (laughs) practitioners are thinking about patients. But for whatever reason, psychiatry has been like fairly uh, impervious to this influence. Mm hmm. So it sounds like a very um, good foundation, like you mentioned, the dietary change, the relaxation response for five minutes at least or at minimum, and then some type of movement. And it it seems like such good medicine. It seems like even common sense to do these things. Do you see huge shifts just with making these small changes, kind of what we would allude to as a hormetic effect or just seeing um, a huge ripple effect based on some small shift that we make in what we're eating. The yes, <laughs> yes, yes, okay. Right. So huge changes. It's and it's shocking to me. And I think you know I do use a lot of nutraceuticals in my practice. I use things like you know I use B vitamins extensively, methylation support. I use you know things like curcumin and butyrate and fatty acids. And I have a, a lot of tricks up my sleeve, all of which I can you know show my patients the papers if they're interested. But for the most part, the type of information that's conveyed genetically through these lifestyle interventions so far surpasses the complexity of what I can achieve using my brain to approach their body, right? Mm -hmm. So there's inherent limitations in that, right? Because it's based on my understanding of the literature and my understanding of their physiology. And as enlightened as that might be, there are necessary limitations to that. So using these much more sophisticated uh, points of intervention, it's, it's astounding. I mean, often it's all I need to do. And within like four to six weeks, I don't have a patient anymore. Mm. And I think that it's, which is of course my goal (laughs) for everyone who Mm. walks in the door for them not to be my patient anymore. You know, I tell my patients when I talk about meditation, because for the most part, I'm not 
you know, like a woo woo hippie, sit on a cushion, look at Buddha type of a person. And I think my patients know that about me, but so I think it's sometimes surprising for them to hear this prescription out of my mouth. But all I tell them is that I've read, you know, two, two decades of, of literature on this. And I can tell you that within 20 minutes, you have changes in your inflammatory gene expression that I would have to use like 14 different mm-hmm. supplements to achieve. So let's try it out. (laughs) That's incredibly profound. Yeah. And sometimes I think it's what we call it because meditation, you know, it's a certain tradition. And when you said relaxation response, which was coined by Dr. Herbert Benson, you know, it it takes on a different uh, tone and maybe sometimes it's, it's what the patient's hearing from us. I totally agree. So I'm kind of curious. So since this is a detox summit, I'd love to get into the area of toxicity a bit with you. And I'm sure that you're seeing that a number of different toxins, being that you have this training in environmental medicine, what have you seen as it relates to perhaps the gut brain access or even the endocrine system, the immune system? the gastrointestinal system, how do you see that these toxins, whether we're talking heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, whatever the toxin of of the day is, how do you see that these toxins interface with these pivotal systems that all track back to the brain? So I sort of think about toxicity in, I guess, three different realms, which is probably a a common way to uh, (laughs) reduce it. I think about, um, you know, sort of environmental and industrial contaminants. Uh, I think about stress physiology, and then I think about dietary toxins. And so, again, my lens is always looking through the gut microbiome. It just, you know, I just take in such a huge amount of information that for me, it's, it's just where I need to laser focus. So when I, when I, you know, read abstracts and I read papers, I'm looking at how are these things affecting you know, affecting this gut microbiome, you know, this, this ecology of uh, organisms that in many ways we have outsourced our uh, physiologic operations to. Mm-hmm. And that, again, we have this information in, in the psychiatric literature, we know that inflammatory biomarkers, so things like um, cytokines and uh, also CRP and homocysteine, that we know that these are highly correlated with at least a very significant subset of mental illness. Uh, We also have animal models where we can replicate states of mental illness through induction of these inflammatory markers. And we also know just even on a pharmacologic level, you know, for example, that like hepatitis patients who are given interferon alpha as treatment have a rate of depression of over 45%, which would never be just a coincidence. Um, And that we can use like anti-inflammatory medications like Celebrex or Enbrel to resolve states of depression in inflamed patients. So, of course, that's not the angle I'm using, but we have a good evidence base that that tells us that this is a good place to focus. And so how do we modulate inflammation? How do we modulate the immune system? We do it, at least I do it, through through the gut, right? And so, so when I think about how can I influence that microbiome, I'm thinking about sort of those three categories that I, I mentioned. But the level of interconnectedness is, is so... Um, it's almost overwhelming. Like, you know, for example, um, you know, you can take uh, bisphenol A. So you can take uh, this this plasticizer BPA, which now, you know, hopefully we can agree is a major endocrine disruptor and is and is. Uh, is, is reason for activating the precautionary principle before we get ourselves into this position where it's so ubiquitous that now we have to clean up after ourselves. But so we know that it can alter the gut epithelium. We know that it can alter the, the gut so that it itself can make changes to the immune system's tolerance to what it's exposed to through the gut, to inflammatory reactions. So, you know, we sort of see that maybe the toxicity precedes the inflammation and then also feeds forward because then you have exposures to other food toxins through that, and you know, sort of through those changes and they all sort of work together. So that's why taking like a very broad approach of cleaning things up, um, you know, is often how I look at it because if you just focus on the metals, if you just focus on the environmental chemicals, if you just focus on the dietary toxins, you may be missing an important, important, um, you know, sort of influence that is is making the patient vulnerable. So, right. uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I can definitely see that. It's kind of this, as you're mentioning, it's a three-prong approach of really looking at the over overarching landscape of somebody's life and what they're exposed to. And perhaps you can speak a little bit to, um, gosh, the, the wealth of research that's looking at the influence of these toxins on things like fetal development or even, um, you know, do these toxins have effects over generations? You know, we're hearing yes. that a bit. And perhaps yes. you can tell the listeners a bit more about the true ripple effect and the the huge impact of these toxins, not just on one generation, but on multiple. And what effects do they actually have on the development of, of children? And yes. has that been well documented? So please yeah. share your, your wisdom <laughs> in this area, because this is really what people want to dive deep into, is how do we protect the children and how do we become better informed? Absolutely. So first, you know, get your tissues because this part, you know, this part can feel very depressing and overwhelming. Um, but, but I will try to tie in some more hopeful takeaway points uh, because the truth of the matter is that we're in big trouble. And, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the biggest reasons for the, the gravity of the situation that we're in um, lie in the way that we approach the scientific research, right? So the way that toxicologists are looking at determining safety or are maybe not even looking at it, which is also a problem, um, has to be fundamentally overhauled. And for, for many reasons, um, I think the most important reasons are that very little toxicology research actually takes into account the role of the endocrine system in determining the toxicity effect. So some of the, the literature that I'm most interested in these days actually looks at the interplay of not just one variable, so not just taking a bunch of rats and exposing them to a pesticide, uh, but in fact of looking at the role of cortisol, for example, so this adrenal stress hormone, uh, the role of cortisol specifically and, and the levels of cortisol um, and how that influences toxicity. And that's just one small example of the dynamic interplay between exposure and the host. Um, so because this is how we need to personalize, ultimately personalize the risks, right? So there's some um, interesting, you know, one of very recent study was looking at the role of um, dioxin. Uh, so, so one of the you know so most potent um, uh, toxic chemicals ever created that's been you know banned for for many decades and is quite persistent. Um, it was sprayed in in the study took place in Vietnam. It was sprayed for defoliation in the '60s, right? And so they looked at women who were breastfeeding, uh, and they found that there was a correlation between cortisol levels in blood and breast milk and saliva and also dioxin levels. So that this, the theory put forth was that the adrenal glands actually bioaccumulate this toxin and it's stimulating to their systems in such a way that influences then their cortisol. And cortisol, as I'm sure has been discussed, uh, is a major mediator of so many things, of sugar balance, of, of fatty acid uh, release, of immune response. Uh, and so it's, you can see how the influence, it's so limiting to, to just look at, you know, if you expose this chemical, what happens to these cells? If you expose this chemical, what happens to its levels? Uh, we really need to start to think about how these toxic chemicals influence many different systems at once. And another big, you know, sort of flaw in the system as it exists is looking at synergy of low dose exposures. Mm. So, you know, we often are only looking at, it's sort of like the analogy that's coming to mind is like when we look at nutrition research and we look at just giving vitamin E for, you know, prostate cancer, for example, you know, that's not how most holistic practitioners operate, right? There's mm -hmm. always a synergy of effects. And so when you're studying something in isolation, you're, you know, your research is inherently limited if you're just looking at one exposure. So anyway, so we now know that very, very low doses, much lower than the EPA would have you believe uh, is relevant, can interact together so that when you, uh, you know, slather some phthalate-laden cream on your body, and then you eat some strawberries with pesticides, you know, and then you have some BPA leached into your lunch, 
you know, nobody's looking at that research. And in fact, the only research that's being done, and it's too late to the party, is really just looking at, um, hot, you know, the relevance of, of low to high doses in a single exposure. So, you know, a good example of this is um, probably the most uh, notorious chemical herbicide, which is Roundup, right? So we have yeah. so much exciting research on, exciting, I guess, on one level, uh, uh, on glyphosate, on, on its most active ingredient, right, and what that can do to gut bacteria. Uh, Anthony Samsell and Stephanie Seneff had, have done a lot of uh, landmark reviews on, provocative reviews on the subject, and they've showed us that, in fact, you know, this chemical influences our gut bacteria in a very dangerous way. It influences the way that our liver actually processes further chemical exposures, right? But in fact, you know, the combination of inactive ingredients that nobody even cares about in Roundup, which is glyphosate plus all of these other inactive ingredients, is about a thousand times more toxic. So it's just sort of a, you know, we need to take a, a step back and say, okay, so the evidence that we have now is so limited, but we do have really compelling evidence still, nonetheless, in, you know, in light of all those limitations that basically are telling us that there are categories of chemical exposures that are disrupting the endocrine systems, not only of moms or so women, uh, but also of their babies. And the most uh, relevant and disturbing uh, evidence of transgenerational effects is from uh, vinclozolin, so a fungicide. And, you know, we've seen that during a specific window of exposure, so it's not just the baby, but the baby's baby that can actually manifest chronic disease related to that exposure. And we should have had a, like a warning about this from um, the use of uh, DES uh, in, in women, which was, uh, you know, sort of like liberally prescribed for um, miscarriage prevention. And, and in fact, like generations later, women developed specific cancers related to that was, was tied back to this transgenerational exposure. So we have precedent to understand that, that this sort of epigenetic influence matters. Uh, but it's, I think it's hard to know what to do with it because even as recently as the past couple of months in the UK and now even in the US, uh, ACOG, so the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, have put out a bulletin, a formal bulletin, saying that in fact women should probably be careful about certain things like, you know, um, gasoline exposure, their dry cleaner, uh, the use of certain plastics. Of course, there's been, you know, warnings about mercury in fish. There's a lot of double talk about mercury or thimerosal uh, in vaccines, and that's a whole other conversation. And you know, so they're starting to become this, like, a, this surfacing awareness about the fact that we need to start being careful. But there was actually a backlash, and a lot of people felt like that was fear-mongering. Uh, a lot of important orga organizations sort of found that to be an appropriate advice to women. Mm -hmm. So you can see that I think it's so overwhelming to consider that we may be uh, polluting future generations before they're even born, that... I think a lot of people feel like we need to wait for more information. But actually the precautionary principle mandate, you know, the mandate is, no, we don't need to wait for any more information. We have plenty of information. Now what are we going to do? And that's where we get into sort of the more, you know, fundamental questions about things like substitution principle, which is this idea, it's okay, so we're going to take BPA out of everything um, and we're going to put in BPS. But what's BPS? Is that safe? You know, is that any safer or does it just have little enough data so far that we haven't seen a signal of harm? And so really understanding how scientists should be engaging in, in these substitutions is an important point of entry. But what I find most exciting actually and empowering is that it's a, it's a real, you know, we can wait for the government to, to catch on and to start to help to protect us. And, it, and that needs to happen, uh, particularly in the realm of our food supply but, and, and subsidies that are going to toxic foods. But we can also just start from the ground up because so many of the most important changes that have happened in terms of uh, consumer products and also, you know, the, the prevalence of organic foods, for example, have happened because of, of economics. You know, have happened because of consumer demand, consumer awareness. And that's why, you know, things like this summit are so exciting to me because 
you know, spreading information about the importance of this and about the power of each individual to make small decisions that have ripple effects is really, you know, is really where it's at. So when I talk to patients about, you know, what they can do um, to protect their fertility, to protect their pregnancies, and to protect their own mental health, and, and of course, physical health and immune systems, I give them like really practical you know, yeah. steps that they can take about eliminating plastics, you know, using more inert containers like glass, um, about filtering their water and using really, you know, brilliant platforms like Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, has a lot of user-friendly information. You can go there and find, you know, what water filter best suits you. Like if you live in New York and you have fluoridated water, like what type of a filter do you need, reverse osmosis or a triple filter, what do you need to, to control for that? What sort of things should you be cooking in? You know, do you want to have Teflon pans or do you want to opt for, you know, glass or stainless steel? And then a big source of exposures is cosmetics. So just helping patients to really understand um, that the fewer words in the ingredient lists in their food and in their cosmetics the better. And so there's just some practical steps that, you know, of course, isn't mitigating the entirety of this issue, but at least is controlling for some of the more local exposures that may contribute to that tipping point of, you know, the development of, of chronic disease in themselves or their babies. And of course, postpartum is a, is a unfortunately vulnerable time for women when it comes to autoimmunity, which is a big focus in my practice. Uh, and so I'm hoping to, to act in a preventive manner by preparing, you know, preparing them during pregnancy for a more quiescent immune response and, and sort of sending their body the signal that things are safe. Yeah. Oh, my word. Dr. Brokan, that was an <laughs> excellent um, explanation of everything. You know, you really painted the picture of a very realistic picture of what we're confronted with. And on the other side of that, you also help to empower us by naming a number of to do's, things that we can implement today if we wanted to, you know, stopping uh, any kind of drinking from plastics or heating with plastic, you know, just even thinking about this in the kitchen and how many women are in the kitchen making these choices on a daily basis. Yeah. So I think that these are fantastic and you really did round out the discussion and, and bring us back into these sustainable, actionable steps. So thank you for that. Before we close our interview, I do have three separate questions and um, I know that these are probably on the listeners' minds, at least in some way, at least they're on my mind and I'm wondering if we can address them. They're somewhat disparate topics, but um, I think we can pull them all together. So the first one that comes up for me as I'm listening to you is thinking about breast milk. I'm yeah. thinking about, you know, women these days, we've been, um, you know, first it was all about the bottle, it was all about formula, and then women yeah. went into this trend of nursing, and this became very in vogue, it became very healthy to do. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering, is it still healthy to do or are we releasing a lot of these toxins that come into the mother's body then right into the baby? So what is your recommendation on nursing? That is a great and such an important question. So this is a very sensitive topic, you know, because I think that it's such a primal drive for a woman who determines that she actually wants to breastfeed her baby and to feel conflicted about it or to feel that she's struggling to actually achieve that is, in, in my experience, one of the most emotionally volatile states that a woman could be placed in. So I, I never want to put a listening woman who is trying valiantly to breastfeed and for whatever reason encountering difficulties in a place of you know, compounding her guilt around it. But I do think it's important that we set the record straight uh, and that we appreciate that we barely know what breast milk is. And in fact, we continue to learn about it. We're just learning about things like the enter enteromammary connection, they're calling it. So which is the trafficking of microbes through breast milk from the mom's gut to the baby. And essentially, you know, we, when it comes to what is the role of breast milk, it's actually in many ways from what we can understand, it's a way of continuing that epigenetic programming from in utero. So after delivery, this is also a means of communicating from the mom to the baby about 
what this environment is all about. And when a baby is born, it's actually in what's called an anti-inflammatory phenotype, which means that it's not really as capable as it ultimately will be uh, in defending itself you know, from pathogens and environmental exposures through its immune system. And it's really relying on the mom in those early months to actually play that role. Um, so there are things like oligosaccharides and myriad fatty acids we can barely quantify and all of these different, you know, mi microbial elements that we're just beginning to appreciate. And unfortunately, none of which are represented in a fair way, uh, even reflecting our current understanding in, in formula. So what about the toxic exposures? Well, one principle, you know, to, to maintain in mind is that placental trafficking of toxins is actually far more significant than uh, than what is passed through lactation. So the damage in many ways, unfortunately, is often already done uh, through pregnancy, which is why thinking about these things as a continuum from conception through, you know, the year, let's say, postpartum is important. And maybe thinking about, and hopefully research will begin to focus on this, of ways that we can mitigate these exposures. So I mentioned some that are just behavioral changes in your environment, but a really interesting Japanese study that I, I found provocative was looking at giving um, six grams of chlorella a day uh, for six months during pregnancy to women who had dioxin exposure. So the same chemical uh, I mentioned earlier. And they found that actually in the breast milk of these women, they had not only lower levels of dioxin, so it's mitigating. But they also had improved secretory IgA, which is essentially like the immune gatekeeper and is, is an important element of the immune sort of like terrain. And so that the immunity of their breast milk was actually improved and the toxicity was decreased. So maybe looking into some of these potential um, food-based uh, mitigating factors, you know, turmeric is another one that I use liberally with my patients and in, in trying to mitigate these exposures and enhance your own detox, right? Because that's where the personalization comes in because we don't know that just being exposed equals badness, right? It's also a matter, it's being exposed, it's what your body does with it, it's what your endocrine system does with it. So there's a lot more to the story than just having it floating around in your blood. So it, from my perspective, you know, I just can't be convinced that there is uh, enough toxicity in our, you know, sort of day-to-day -day environmental exposure that cannot be largely mitigated through behavioral, uh, ram you know, sort of behavioral changes that would outweigh the benefits of breast milk, largely the benefits that we barely understand. So that's where we just have to remain open to what we are learning and what we're not yet able to quantify because this is, you know, this is an evolutionary practice for a reason. And to think that we can do better is, is just an act of hubris, unfortunately, I think. So I, I still recommend I still recommend it. <laughs> oh, yay. I'm glad to hear that. And your argument makes a lot of sense. And I think if the mother takes these precautions and works on her health, then that'll come through as well. So I think that we have uh, time just for one more question, and this is going to be a very hot topic, a very controversial one, which uh, I'm sure our listeners are already thinking about and wondering what your reaction and response is to this, and that is that of vaccines. What is your take on vaccines? Are they toxic? Are they not? Should we be getting them? And um, how would you see this in light of all of our talk on toxicity? So I'm so glad that you asked um, because I think, you know, this is an issue that I've been researching intensively for about six years. And I'm continually surprised that the topic is not more openly discussed in functional medicine circles. You know, we acknowledge that we are in a crisis of chronic autoimmune and inflammatory disease from birth to death, and that this crisis is perpetuated by toxic exposures, right? And we're taught and told that vaccines are, quote unquote, unavoidably unsafe, which is a premise based on the assumption of their efficacy and really the dismissal of their risks. Um, so I think that there are three important take-home points that I'd like to distill for anyone who's interested in questioning uh, memes of, of vaccination. And I think the, the first one is that I believe that the science of uh, vaccinology, if you want to call it that, is based on really misconceived models of immunity. 
So the premise of immunity that vaccine science is predicated on is really, in my opinion, outdated and incomplete. And vaccine efficacy is based on the production of antibodies. So that's how we are assured of the protective effect of vaccines. It's an adaptive immune response that we now know to be only part of a much more sophisticated interplay involving the innate immune system as well, and perhaps even elements that have yet to be you know, discovered and elucidated. So this is likely why we see documented outbreaks of disease in highly vaccinated populations, sometimes up to 100%. And we see increased spread of disease through vaccination as demonstrated you know, by recent data on the whooping cough vaccine, on measles, and even increased risk of viral illness after flu vaccination. So you know, in light of some of the things that we've discussed, I think it's important to remember that we've co-evolved with the microbial world to an extent that almost half of our genome is comprised of virus or virus-like DNA. And our gut bacteria is, you know, they outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. And so we have to bear this in mind when we think about true herd immunity and how it happens from community-based natural infections, that that concept is one that arises from uh, circulating natural infections, so that the goal of eradicating these evil bugs is really wrongheaded, and it's, and it's in defiance of where medicine is going, which is to leverage our relationship with microbes for, for health and, and longevity. So the second point would be, uh, of course, an important one, which is unintended consequences. So the current schedule has never been studied. Not one vaccine in a truly vaccinated versus unvaccinated true placebo control design, let alone multiple delivered at once or the entire long-term effects of 49 doses of 14 vaccines by age six. So even if vaccines were effective, we might be trading acute illness, often benign and treatable despite prevalent fear-mongering, for disabling chronic disease. And this is really because vaccines are prepared with adjuvants such as aluminum and a long list of toxic ingredients such as polysorbate 80 and formaldehyde, which stimulate really unpredictable inflammatory responses. So vaccine science has been trying to get out from under the oppressive fact of its own danger and toxicity by moving from live to attenuated to fractional and recombinant designs and, and this progression is really increasing the risks associated with molecular mimicry or overlap between self and non-self fragments of DNA, as well as the untestable inclusion of endogenous retroviruses such as SV40, which was unintentionally introduced with the polio vaccine and now is an identified carcinogen. So we know from seminal studies that more vaccines delivered simultaneously equals higher risk of mortality, and that there are thousands of parents who have witnessed irreversible changes in death in their children, and they're unable to sue the pharmaceutical company that delivered the product based on a liability protection design in which the government underwrites the entire program. So their concerns are dismissed, but how can we dismiss them without proper safety data? How would we even design the safety data when we're just beginning to understand things we've talked about today, like transgenerational epigenetics and mitochondrial functioning and oxidative stress as being part of biochemical individuality and risk stratification? So I think the last point is, you know, is sort of potentially a bit of a political one, but it's the conflict of interest. And, and really the toothlessness of the FDA regulatory system uh, for pharmaceutical products like this. You know, the financial enmeshment between pharma and government, in my opinion, are really putting profits over best judgment when it comes to this. You know, my research into pharmaceutical corruption that has shaped the field of psychiatry has really opened my eyes to, to entire medical belief systems that can be established through faulty assumptions that ultimately serve wholesale marketing of a product and not health. So vaccines are, are really the only product delivered to all people, regardless really of individual known and potential risk factors. So in the realm of pharmaceutical products, you know, we know that years to decades can be required to establish a causative relationship between the product and its risks, like before we really see the true colors. And in the meantime, you or your loved ones are playing Russian roulette. 
So, you know, the FDA and pharmaceutical companies conceive of health through a totally different paradigmatic lens than that which we're putting forth in a summit like this. Mm. They just, you know, the ideas that, that fuel their um, approach are just totally antithetical to a lot of what we've talked about. So I really encourage everyone to research this issue on sites like GreenMedInfo, NVIC.org, and VaccinationCouncil.org to really try to unearth some information that has not been corrupted by, you know, more paternalistic models of, of profit-driven medicine. So... That's my two cents on the matter. Very eloquently stated, and uh, you've given us lots to think about with that response. It, it sounds like we have to look beyond the question of whether or not to vaccinate and look at the paradigm itself, look at all the, the tentacles of different yeah. people and organizations that are behind that. So very, um, lots of good food for thought there, Dr. Brogan. Thank you very much for um, your, your clear answer on how to approach such a very unwieldy, difficult topic that uh, confronts so many parents today. You're clearly a, uh, a physician on a mission, and um, I love the uh, whole perspective you take on women's health as well and helping to bring and elevate women's health to a whole other level, especially in the 21st century. I truly appreciate your eloquence and your passion, which is definitely coming through every word that you say. <laughs> So thank you for being part of this summit and sharing with us your information and also giving us that inspiration to make these small, subtle changes. And back to your guidance again, dietary change, relaxation response, and movement. Yes. How can the listeners get in touch with you? How can they read your marvelous blogs? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's so much fun. I really, really enjoy it. I get so much pleasure out of even just connecting to like minds. Um, so this is a huge honor. And um, yeah, I have a uh, I have a website, which is just kellybroganmd.com. I try to uh, produce a lot of substantive content, uh, but also some more digestible content in my newsletter where I have snippets, which are just sort of, you know, what do I need to know about the science that came out? Uh, you know, this month. And so I also am active on, uh, on Facebook and, uh, and Twitter. So, so that's where I'm at. Yes. And I hope that all the listeners will find you. Um, her writings are really phenomenal, uh, just like her speaking is. So thank you again, Dr. Brogan. And uh, we hope to have you as part of this movement. And I think we will. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. <laughs> 